Good afternoon. I'm Jennifer Hammondy, and I'd like to welcome you back to our series focused on the importance of transitioning to a safe systems approach to prevent fatalities and injuries on our nation's roads. During our last event, we focused on what is a safe system, and I appreciated the amazing discussion that I had with the panelists. If you weren't able to watch that event live, at the conclusion of today's discussion, I encourage you to visit NTSB's YouTube page and check it out. The conversation helped to lay the groundwork for the other events that we'll be hosting over the next few months. At the end of this discussion, I will talk a little bit about some of our plans moving forward. And that includes, of course, our event today, which is focused on safe speeds. Eliminating speeding related crashes is on the NTSB's most wanted list of transportation safety improvements and has been since 2019. Over the last several years, our nation's approach to reducing fatalities and injuries has been largely focused on human error and education and enforcement countermeasures. But those alone won't drive down deaths on our roadways. And we know that deaths and injuries, particularly for pedestrians, bicyclists, and other road users are increasing. To combat that, we need to take a, more, a much more holistic approach to traffic safety. So why does the NTSB care so much about the safe system approach? Because we know from decades of our crash investigations that it works. We conduct every single one of our crash investigations in all modes that we investigate, aviation, highways and transit, marine, rail, pipelines and hazardous materials. And in our safety studies, including our 2017 speeding study in a systemic way. I often take for granted that, that people don't know how we conduct our investigations. For example, one of our panelists today who you'll meet is a senior investigator with our Office of Highway Safety, Kenny Bragg. He served as the investigator in charge of a 2019 crash where a commercial driver of a pickup truck towing a trailer crossed the center line and struck numerous motorcyclists and their, uh, their riders, killing seven and injuring another seven. It would have been easy for us to conclude that the pickup driver was impaired he it self-admittedly used three to 10 bags of heroin a day and also was impaired with cocaine and fentanyl in his system. And so if we just ended it at that and wrapped it up, we wouldn't be doing our job, which is our mission to determine how a crash happened and prevent it from happening again. So just as we do all our investigations, uh, we look at weather and roadway conditions. We look at the combination, in this case, we looked at the combination vehicle, the motorcycles. We looked at the technologies that could have either prevented the crash or mitigated injury in the crash. We looked at the motor carrier operations, federal and state laws, regulations, policies, and procedures that enabled that driver to continue driving even though his license was suspended. And human factors and emergency response. While we don't investigate every single crash in highways, that's not our mandate. We do investigate every single aviation accident in the United States. And because of our comprehensive approach, because we are the leaders in aviation safety, we went nearly a decade without any fatalities in commercial passenger aviation, zero. We can achieve that on our roads, we can. There was a time we could never imagine that in aviation, that in aviation and look how far we've come. But it's going to take hard work by all stakeholders and some major changes to how we as a nation look at road safety and address road safety. So let's get to it. I want to invite the panelists to turn on your cameras. So uh, just so those watching know, this is not pre-scripted. I sent out uh, questions just to get people thinking, but uh, we really want this to be a discussion. So, you know, feel free to chime in as we get into the discussion. But first I wanna start out with 
I, I thought it'd be better if folks introduced themselves uh, rather than me just continuing to talk. Uh, so I'll go from left to right on my screen. We'll start with Ken. Hi, uh, I'm Ken McLeod. I'm the policy director for the League of American Bicyclists. The League of American Bicyclists is a national nonprofit dedicated to building a bicycle friendly America for everyone. Really excited to talk about speeding and speed today. Um, it is one of the most important issues in traffic safety and it's one of the ones that is often overlooked um, for people biking, people walking. Um, that speed that they encounter on their their day to day travel um, is critically important for their safety and comfort. Um, and really excited to see NTSB's uh, attention to that and the safe system approach. Thanks, Ken. Natalie. Hi, everyone, and thanks so much for having me. Uh, my name is Natalie Drazen, and I'm the North American Director and United Nations Representative for the FIA Foundation. Uh, we're a global philanthropy that's dedicated to safe and sustainable mobility, and we've long collaborated with the U.S. Uh, we work with partners all over the world to save lives on roads through low speeds and through the safe systems approach in particular. And recently we supported the Johns Hopkins University Safe Systems Consortium in authoring recommendations on the infrastructure bill. Uh, during UN Global Road Safety Week, we worked with the World Health Organization to call for uh, low speeds to save lives. And that was endorsed by leading US organizations and mayors. And we are thrilled to see the NTSB uh, taking the lead in this discussion and highlighting low speeds and very grateful to be here today. Thank you. Thanks, Natalie. And we'll go to Kenny Bragg and then we'll go to Wen. Good morning, uh, Member Harm Harmony. Good afternoon, I should say. My name is Kenny Bragg. I'm a senior investigator in the Office of Highway Safety. Um, I've been with the board for about eight years and my background um, comes from law enforcement where I did both traffic uh, enforcement and uh, crash investigation. I'm really happy to participate in this forum today. Thank you. And when who? And Good then afternoon, we'll go to Salida. Sorry. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Wen Fu. I'm a senior research transportation engineer at the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety. We are an independent nonprofit research organization, and we are um, dedicated to reduce fatalities, injuries, and property damages from motor vehicle crashes. So our research covers um, every aspect of highway safety, including uh, vehicles, roads, um, and road users. Um, so speed has always been one of our major research topics. It's my pleasure to be here uh, with everyone here. It's a great panel, and I really look forward to the discussion. Wen and I have been on a previous speeding panel at Lifesavers, so it's good to be back together again. Uh, Salida, and then we'll go to Russ. Great, good morning. I'm Salida Reynolds. I'm the general manager of Los Angeles Department of Transportation. And uh, LADOT switched to a safe systems approach for our Vision Zero plan in 2018. And uh, we've been working hard um, at advancing that paradigm shift um, since then. I think that you know one of the, the things we observed during the pandemic is that there's absolutely an inflection point uh, where traffic turbulence uh, reduces to a level that speeds spike um, to, a, to a, a sort of a, um, a pretty astonishing height. And the result of that uh, is, is pretty predictable. Uh, and in LA, we like many other cities saw uh, an increase in fatalities during the pandemic. And that increase in fatalities did not impact our communities in an equitable way, just as all roadway fatalities don't impact our community in an equitable way, particularly in South LA, predominantly uh, Black and Latino neighborhood. We saw a 25% increase um, in crashes compared to and deaths compared to the rest of the city. Uh, and we know that speeding is a primary factor in determining the severity of those crashes. We've been hard at work with our partners uh, here at, at NACTO and many of the folks on this call um, to try and change state legislation around how we set and enforce speed limits. So we're really, really grateful to the NTSB, Jennifer, to you, um, in putting together a dream panel. Um, a lot of the folks on this panel represent institutions that I have been dying to talk to for years. Um, so I'm really, really excited that we all get to have a conversation today. Thanks for inviting me. Great, thanks for joining, Salida. Russ, and then to Jenny. 
So hello everyone, uh, my name is Russ Martin and I'm the Senior Director of Policy and Government Relations at the Governor's Highway Safety Association. We're the association of state and territorial highway safety offices who implement behavioral highway safety programs in the states. And all of our members receive grants from the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration for highway safety programs. And uh, of course, we, we address all different kinds of highway safety programs, but speeding is a big part of that because of the size of the speeding problem in the United States. And over the last a couple of years, we've seen a confluence of factors that, that uh, at least constructively has uh, led us to take a closer look at speed. You know, during the pandemic, we saw increases in excessive speeding across the board, and uh, we have this crisis in pedestrian safety and uh, uh, really a crisis for all non-motorized road users who, of course, are, are experience an outsized impact uh, that comes from speeding. So I'm glad to be here, and I want to thank you for inviting us, and we'll look forward to the discussion. Thanks, Russ. Jenny? Hi, thanks so much for having me. My name is Jenny O'Connell. I'm a senior program manager at NACDO, which is the National Association of City Transportation Officials. We work with 91 uh, cities, city transportation agencies and transit, transit agencies across North America on all things from uh, bikeway and transit street design to uh, safety policy and shared micro mobility policy. So at NACTO, I manage our safety and vision zero work. Um, and over the past couple of years, I've been working a lot on speed limits and speed limit reduction, working with a large group of NACTO cities to develop guidance um, called city limits, which provides a new method methodology for setting speed limits on urban streets that takes into account the conflict density of a street and its activity level to make decisions about how fast cars should be going on that street. Um, so I'm really excited to be here. Thank you so much for having NACTO on this panel. Thanks, Jenny and Amy. Thanks so much for having me. I'm honored to be here. And I was also asked to share a little bit about Sammy. So I'm going to just launch right into my personal experience. 2,842 days, nearly 41 million minutes. That's how long it's been since I last kissed my kind, adorable 12-year-old son goodbye and then never saw him alive again. Sammy was in eighth grade. He just needed to walk from school to soccer practice and that should not have to be a deadly act. It's incomprehensible to describe what it is like to bury your child and then have to figure out how to live without him. I spend a lot of time remembering so many memories. Sammy was so boisterous and verbally outspoken, but he didn't start out that way. When he was little, his big sister always knew exactly what he wanted, so much so that he hardly said more than a few words until he was three. And then one, way, one day we went to visit the Bronx Zoo for the holiday light show. And he stood in wonder at the elephant cage while the zookeepers fed them. And he said, the elephant ate the whole apple. And that sentence really was Sammy's first word. Since then, he didn't stop asking questions and marveling at life's many wonders. And he was really determined. Only a few weeks before he died, he rode his bicycle 100 miles in a century ride. My husband called it the 75 mile marker. You know, Sammy was sprawled out on the ground. My husband took a picture and he said, I think we're gonna be home soon, but not Sammy. You know, he forced himself to get up and he mustered the strength to continue. And he ended up being the youngest one that year to complete the entire 100 miles. His curiosity, passion, and determination would have done so much to fix the problems we face. But since he is not here, I fight for him. I joined with others and co-founded Families for Safe Streets. Every one of us at FSS has lost a family member or suffered a life-altering injury. Every single one of our members has a story like mine. And we band together to confront the complacency and fight for safe streets so that others do not suffer as we have. We started with under two dozen members in New York City and now have uh, uh, thousands across the country. We advocate for policy and legislative changes and provide to su support to those personally impacted. A key problem we have fought to address and one that we are here to discuss today is managing speed. Our initial fight in New York City was to lower the speed limit because lower speed limits save lives. 
We have also successfully fought for the nation's largest speed camera program and for a comprehensive streets master plan that will redesign streets in New York City to manage speed. You know, it's horrific that it is socially access acceptable to drive so fast. And then we encourage bad behavior by raising speed limits because of federal policy. Everyone thinks it's okay to go fast. We still joke about it. Having a lead foot is funny, the way that having a, a one drink for the road used to be funny. But I know horrifically all too well that even a few miles per hour can be the difference between life and death. A year after Sammy was killed, a five-year-old boy was hit in the exact same location in front of our home. We had successfully fought to lower the speed limit and that driver was obeying it. That boy survived and mine did not. Our mission is to confront the preventable epidemic of traffic violence. And we chose that word confront intentionally because we have sadly learned that we need to push back on the complacency in our efforts to lower the speed limit, get permission to operate speed cameras and redesign streets to manage speed. We take to the streets, we hold vigils. We have even engaged in civil disobedience. It should not take this kind of activism from heartbroken people like me for our elected officials to act, take action and for, to allow municipalities to address the deadly nature of speed. In his memory, I urge you to draw from Sammy's words. His last school assignment was to write about his name, Samuel Cohen Eckstein. I will share a portion of his assignments as, as a remembrance and as a call to all of you to join with Sammy to exercise your leadership and prevent this horror from happening to any other family. I'll read a little bit of his assignment name um, now. Leadership by Name by Samuel Cohen Eckstein. My name means God heard. It means high priests and it means architectural strength. My name means pretending times are good when they are bad. It means leadership and it means pain. My name was chosen because it sounded like happiness, but that happiness has put an invisible weight on my shoulders, the weight of leadership. I am the Samuel, the one God heard, Cohen, the one who with my family and ancestors led a religion, Eckstein, the one cornerstone among thousands, the one corner that has to support everybody while withstanding pain and sorrow. I like my name. I just can't imagine myself as a Jacob or a Luca. I am a Sam and that's just who I am. I used to prefer Sammy, but that sounds too young and childish. Sam is more substantial. He goes on a little more, I'll skip it. And I'll just, the last sent, couple sentences are, I am neither a Samuel nor a Sammy. There are two extreme. I am in the middle. I am a Sam. I am like a lake. I look pure and simple, but if you look in the right places, you can find a lot beneath my surface. I share his words today to urge you to put the weight of leadership on your shoulders to find what is below your surface. Sammy inspires me. I fight for change in his memory and hope that you will have the courage to bear the weight of leadership, to fight for and put in place solutions to save lives, even if they may not initially be popular choices. I mean, how is it possible that the vast majority of nations like ours have dramatically reduced the number of people killed on their roadways and are dramatically safer than ours. We rank at the bottom of high income nations in terms of traffic safety, 41st of 49, with only eight countries having fewer per capita traffic deaths. We need to start by making a national commitment to reducing traffic deaths on our roadways to zero. Only by making that commitment will safety be prioritized to prevent these ridiculous policies like raising speed limits because people drive too fast, making it so hard to lower speed limits, enforce them with automated speed safety cameras and redesign streets to manage speed. With a zero traffic deaths commitment, these changes would not and should not be so hard to make. Thank you very much. 
Amy, thank you very much for uh, sharing Sammy's story. And I just have to say Sammy's an inspiration, but so are you. You know, families like you are the reason why I'm at the NTSB. So thank you. Thank you for all you do. Thank you all. I mean, we, you know, we're all together in improving safety. Uh, we may all have different views of getting there, but that's okay. There's not one right way. We just have to form the commitment. And I think all of us are co committed. We just have to get others committed to also eliminating deaths on our roads, specific, specifically speeding related. Uh, um, so thank you, Amy. Um, you know, uh, Amy mentioned a couple of a couple of things, and one I I had recently had a question about why I use the term traffic violence. A lot of people don't understand why I use that term or haven't heard it, and I was wondering if anyone wanted to chime in on why we use the term traffic violence. <laughs> no one wants to step in. Well, I mean, you know, it, I, we have a pandemic on our nation's roads and it is violence. It People are dying. Go ahead, Amy. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I, I was speaking and had my mic off. Oh, okay. Good. That's okay. You know, that it is in our mission statement just for that reason. It really is to make people aware that these are not accidents. No, right? they are not. People often ask me, what do we think the biggest problem is on why we are such a dangerous nation and we're not putting in place the solutions? And I always answer, it's because we don't even have a problem. We don't recognize we have a problem we can fix, right? We call it an accident. It's not an accident, it's a crash. It's a violent crash. This is an epidemic of traffic violence and it's one we can fix. Thank you for that. Well, I we to say um, that you know, in, in LA, there was a long period of time where the number of people killed on our on our roads, half of whom are, are the most vulnerable folks, people walking and biking, um, exceeded uh, the number of gun-related homicides in the city. And the reason that I use the term traffic violence is to draw attention to the tremendous amount of outrage and all of the architecture and investment we make to prevent gun-related homicides, to prevent um, gang-related homicides, and, and that we should be acting with the same level of urgency and attention um, for all of the reasons that, that vulnerable human bodies don't feel safe and don't have freedom of movement um, on our streets and in our cities, public spaces. And part of what we have to do is kind of startle people out of their uh, apathy around this issue. And so using stronger language that is more confrontational, Amy, to your point, that word to confront um, words really matter. And when we sort of have gotten into this groove that people are comfortable talking about this problem using very passive language, um, using very neutral language, it obscures um, the true nature of the problem. And I, as, a, as a history major and a, um, somebody who loves language, I feel like that's a very powerful place, uh, but underrated place to start because it opens up a conversation. Jennifer, you got that question because you're using provocative language and then it allows you to maybe change people's perspective on, on the whole issue. Um, so I think it's really important and I hope we find more and more ways and new ways and different ways to talk about this so that our human brains um, can really grasp the full nature of the problem. Yeah, and that, I was actually really glad I got the question because then the person who asked just hadn't heard that uh, phrase before and just thought it was so on point. So it did allow me uh, to talk about that. So I think that's a great point. Uh, what constitutes safe speed and um, why single out speed from all other um, uh, uh, causes of traffic crashes on our roads when we talk about a safe system? I'd love to jump in on this one. Um, 
you know, I think that one of the important things to kind of keep in mind about safe systems that it really is sort of an interlocking way of thinking about safety on our streets. Um, so, you know, when we talk about speed, um, speed is sort of at the center of a lot of those interlocking pieces. And there are really clear physics and mathematical relationships about, um, you know, speed and uh, crash likelihood and crash survivability. So addressing speed, you know, Amy mentioned that that reducing speed limits was the first place that Families for Safe Streets started. And it's because, um, you know, uh, speed limits have an impact on the speed that cars go and the speed that cars or, or motor vehicles go has an impact on the likelihood of a crash and the severity of that crash. Um, but what's sort of interesting too about speed is that there's a, a number of different ways to sort of come at it. There's, um, which is why it's sort of at the center of safe systems in a lot of ways, you know, there's the, the policy side, the speed limits, um, there's the design side, you know, the way that streets look um, and people can operate on them. There's the, the operations of streets, signalization. Um, and then there's also um, vehicle design um, and vehicle uh, speed control as well. So lots of different components of the safe systems approach really touch speed. Great, thanks Jenny. And, and if folks wanna chime in, feel free. Kenny, were you looking to chime? Yeah, I wanted to point out that one of the reasons we focus on speed is because speed affects many, many other aspects of, this, of safe driving. Um, first of all, it, it increases accidents or crash severity, but it also limits the amount of distance and amount of time we have to, to respond to something that happens unexpectedly. And then the other thing to remember is many times, you know, speed affects uh, handling characteristics. So if you take an evasive maneuver at 35 miles per hour, your, your vehicle is going to handle differently if you do the same maneuver at 70 miles per hour. So speed really does focus on many, it does affect many other areas of safe driving. I'd love to jump in if I may. Um, and, you know, this really speaks to Amy's powerful and courageous uh, tragedy. Uh, you know, when we think about safe speeds, we also really have to consider safe speeds for children because road traffic crashes are the leading cause of death for those ages one to 25 in this country. Um, and so that's why a successful safe systems approach has to include this population. And when you think about children, they're smaller, right? And they can't sustain the same impact as we as adults can. And on top of that, as I'm very quickly learning with my toddler, their movements are unpredictable. Uh, but the safe systems approach recognizes that we all make mistakes when we drive and we should never pay with our children's lives like Amy had to pay with Sammy's life. Uh, and so this is why the WHO recommends speed limits of 20 miles an hour where children live, learn and play because hit at 20 miles an hour, a child has a chance at survival, but at 50 miles an hour, they don't. And as Amy said, even that five mile an hour difference makes a difference. Um, but in practicality, you know, our, our partner, National Center for Safe Routes to School, uh, who we work with on Vision Zero for Youth, found that often Vision Zero plans actually don't include children or just include them as targets of education. And so, tar so conversations like this can help change that. And I also want to address your question, Jennifer, about why we should single out speed, just with some international examples. You know, we're talking a lot about COVID right now and vaccines because they're best line of defense, but there's a vaccine for road traffic injuries as well, and that's speed, speed reduction. And around the world, this works. Um, in Tanzania, our partner Amend worked hand, with hand, hand in hand uh, with the community to reduce speeds around schools through 20 mile an hour speed zones. And that, with infrastructure, reduced injuries by 26%. Um, Sao Paulo, Brazil is actually a case control study on this because in 2015, the mayor reduced speeds on highways, um, but the new mayor then reversed that policy. And we saw that speeds were lower, 21.7% lower uh, with the lower uh, speed limit. Um, and Sorry, crashes were 21.7% lower. And also that, pres pres I'm sorry, that saved 104 lives. Um, and low-income residents benefit, benefited mostly from that reduction. Um, Bogota, Colombia had the cost-effective tactic of targeting high-risk roads, 
They focused on five arterial roads and prevented 60 deaths in six months. Um, so with limited budgets and time, we can take these very targeted approaches to speed reduction, targeting the most uh, high risk areas. Great points. Just looking around to make sure. Oh, Ken, I saw you took your mute, mute off. Go for yeah, it. I, I really appreciate all the discussion about uh, speed reduction from Natalie and all the effort by Amy and Families for Safe Streets to reduce speed limits in New York City. Um, I think it's really important to uh, kind of just put it in the record that uh, that 20 miles per hour that Natalie brought up as the safest speed for people biking and walking is not uh, legal in many states because there are state laws that have statutory speed limits that prevent uh, communities from making streets 20 miles per hour. So when you look at bicyclists and pedestrian deaths, uh, you don't see as much speeding related deaths in the NHTSA fatality data as overall. Overall traffic fatalities, about 30% are speeding related. For bicycle and, bicycles and pedestrians, it's about 8%. Um, so it's it's not speeding that's the real threat to people biking and walking. It is just speed, period. Um, so we really need to focus on that speed reduction and where we can't design slower speed roads because, you know, it, it's not allowed, it's not politically acceptable. Um, we really need to make sure that there are safe and comfortable and cohesive networks for people biking and walking so that they're separated uh, from that high speed traffic that's so dangerous to them. Fantastic points. I and I want to get into some of the, the policies and state laws and in a second, but I just read in 2011 study by the AAA Foundation of Traffic Safety found that the average risk of a pedestrian being severely injured in a motor vehicle crash is 10% at an impact speed of 16 miles per hour. The risk increases to 25% at a vehicle speed of 23 miles per hour 50% at 31 miles per hour, 75% at 39, and 90% at 46 miles per hour. So uh, the, the risk goes up as speed, as speed increases. And so I, let's talk a little bit about how we set speed limits in our country, which is set by speed. So <laughs> if we, it, it, it just may, uh, it makes no sense to me. I mean, we have, and, and I know that, um, I think, can you participate on, uh, on a panel with the MUTCD? If, you, if I can talk about 85th percentile, uh, if you'd like, or you can, up to you. I'm happy to, to start. So the, the league has been a member of the National Committee on Uniform Traffic Control Devices for, I think, over 20 years. Um, it's this body that influences this uh, federally adopted thing called the Manual on Uniform Traffic Control Devices. And that includes this standard for speed limit setting um, in Section 2B13. Um, and, and right now, the analysis that is required there is the speed distribution of free flowing vehicles. So it's all about uh, vehicles going with no congestion. Um, and that is usually based around this thing called the 85th percentile, where the 15% of highest speed vehicles determine what the speed is um, based on some studies, I think from like the 60s or 70s. Uh, that showed in, in rural areas or on um, non-urban streets, that was generally safest because you had kind of uniformity in speed of the traffic. Um, what the 85th percentile leaves out, especially in urban areas, is people biking and walking, people not in those vehicles. They have no say in what is a safe speed when you're determining speed limits only based on the uh, speed of vehicles and particularly the speed of the fastest vehicles. Well, and if you are setting speeds based on somebody uh, requesting a, a new analysis of speed limits on a road and you're looking at uh, what 85% of vehicles are moving at, over time, you're gonna end up with increasing speed limits. And that's what we've seen in the United States. And we've seen, we've seen states go from you know, 70 miles per hour to now we have a state that's 85 miles per hour. And I know that's on really big 
you know, highways where you won't have pedestrians and you won't have bicyclists. Um, but, you know, you th that 85th percentile doesn't just apply to large roads, it applies to all of it, it the, the neighborhood I live in. So, um, you know, it's definitely um, something that has led to increasing uh, 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 fatalities on our roads. And that study you mentioned on how did we get to the 85th percentile, which has somehow become the rule of thumb for many traffic engineers across the U.S. is um, uh, goes back to the the 50s. So, Salita, you said something about that that I really loved in one of in a recent event about using a study from the 50s to. Yeah, I mean, those were 1950s cars on 1950s roads. You know, they're they're. We can do, in, in LA, we had to increase the speed limit on almost 200 miles of urban streets. And half of those were on what we call our high injury network, which is our, the 6% of our city streets that account for two thirds of the severe and fatal crashes um, that we experience every year. And the order of magnitude is 250 people, 250 Angelinos die every year. That is a stubborn and persistent trend. We know if we do not change the status quo, that will continue to happen. Um, we had done not one single thing in the to the design of those streets to make them faster. They became faster because cars are faster, because cars are larger, because cars are more powerful. They accelerate more quickly. You know, auto manufacturers sell as a feature how quickly their vehicles can accelerate from zero to 60 miles an hour. And there are plenty of examples actually in traffic engineering where we went back and looked at, you know, the studies we used to come up with some of these uh, rules of thumb and discovered them lacking. You know, a few years ago, uh, we were timing the walking speed at every traffic signal in this country at four feet per second. Um, which, you know, was uh, the rule of thumb was, well, that's how fast most people walk. But when somebody went back and looked at that study and looked at it more carefully, what they discovered is that that was the 50th percentile walking speed, meaning we had been timing our walking speed in the United States to intentionally strand half of the people who would be crossing the street. There's no reason why we cannot go back now and re-examine the foundations of that 85th percentile rule, um, you know, not changing, if you were in business and you didn't change the rules for 50 years, you'd be out of business. Um, but for some reason we accept that, I think because the powerful opposition force argument um, is that if we touch that, we will be artificially lowering speed limits um, and therefore creating uh, a, a great American punching bag, the speed trap. And because most Americans drive, the, the threat of a speed trap um, is, you know, feels very outrageous and people get very self-righteous about it. Um, and so we have to kind of get away from that framing altogether and kind of ground this argument in a little bit more common sense. You know, cars in the 50s they couldn't, you know, they couldn't take corners at 40 miles an hour. They couldn't do all of the things that our cars can do today. Um, and so what a safe speed is probably bears some real sort of, sort of soul searching um, on our part. Yeah, so what's the answer to setting speed limits? The, uh, F the Federal Highway Administration has uh, asked for comments on the MUTCD and changes to it. We have weighed in uh, several times to eliminate the 85th percentile approach to setting speed limits. It doesn't look at roadway conditions. It doesn't look at who's using the roads. It doesn't look at road design. So what's the, uh, what's the solution? How should we be setting speed limits? And should federal highways reconsider that approach? Uh, yeah, I'd love to jump in um, and just, I, ha I had a couple of reactions to a few things that people said. I mean, you know, um, 
I think at the beginning of this call, Amy mentioned that we're the 41st out of 49 high income, high income countries in our traffic fatality rate per 100,000 residents. Um, and that's not a mistake, that's an intentional, I mean, we've made intentional choices as a country to get us to that point. And one of the, one of the culprits in that is the MUTCD and that mandate to have the 85th percentile drive um, the, the speed limit setting in this country. And interestingly, um, on a call during the comment process for the MUTCD, I heard somebody from Federal Highway Administration say that that you know, inclusion of the 85th percentile was never intended to be a require or isn't intended to be a requirement. And please let us know if, if anybody is interpreting it that way. But we just heard a whole long story from Salida about the fact that it's certainly being interpreted as a requirement. And in California, it's codified in their state vehicle code. So it's um, you know, really important to mention that with the MUTCD in particular, you know, this is something that is fully within the jurisdiction of the Federal Highway Administration. There is no approval needed from Congress. There is no you know, sort of a voting process for making changes to the MUTCD. And research from the National Transportation Safety Board shows that um, the 85th percentile methodology results in higher speeds and higher speed limits over time, which is some of what, what we've been talking about on this call. Um, so you know, given all of that, it's really, I'm personally really looking forward to seeing the 85th percentile come out of the MUTCD. Um, and, um, you know, I think that the alternative approach is an approach that uses context to make a decision about um, what the speed limits on the street should be that uses what we know about what are the safe survivable speeds on streets to decide what the speed limit should be. Um, and that does not rely on the speed that people are already driving. So basically setting you know, safety as our top goal and letting all of the decisions that we make about our road fall in line underneath that goal, um, including you know, making context sensitive decisions about what our speed limit should be given who's using the road, who we want to be using the road, where the road is, what the conditions of the road are and so forth. Well, Jenny, why don't can you talk a little bit? You mentioned city limits, which is something that you you have worked on. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I'm happy to. So the city limits guidance um, again was developed with a, a large group of NACTO cities based on existing best practice in a number of cities across um, the country and and actually the world. Um, and basically, it's it's a fairly simple concept. It says that you know, instead of uh, measuring what the speeds are on the street to make decisions about the, what the speed limit should be, um, that instead you should be looking at how likely you are to have a conflict on the street and then how active that street is or how active you want that street to be with multimodal activity. And um, we've developed a really simple matrix. Um, and basically, it, you know, if you, you decide what the activity level is and what the conflict density is, and you look on the matrix, it's gonna basically give you an, a number um, for your street that's a maximum um, speed limit that we think, think is safe. And, and the maximum speed limit, by the way, for, for the lowest density, sort of least active street in urban areas, you know, per, per NACTO is 35 miles per hour maximum. Um, so, you know, that gives you a sense of the range that we're talking about. We're not, we think that speed limits above 35 miles per hour have no place um, in cities where you should expect pedestrians. Um, so that's the basic methodology that we put forth in the, in the city limits guidance. And again, you know, that's not, that's based on, on what we've seen cities doing and what we've seen cities adopting um, as, they, as they lower their speed limits across the country. Well, and you, you mentioned that some states think the MUTCD is um, mandatory, and that's true. <laughs> and so others have asked me and said, well, the, the most recent proposal is to soften the language a little bit in the MUTCD on, in the proposal um, that makes it look a little bit more uh, optional. It just should not even be a factor. So it just should go. Uh, other things should be uh, looked at, as you said, um, roadway design, conditions, users, things that should be the focus on determining what the speed limit is in an area. Um, so we used to have a national speed limit. Now we have states setting speed limits 
where does that leave you know cities and localities who that have decided hey we have a speeding issue here and i'm just going to use my own experience we i live in a neighborhood it's a very small neighborhood and it's uh state owned roads our neighborhood uh goes in a pretty large circle with a street down the middle and when you come into the neighborhood we have had officers, I've had to call officers out for people driving, I'm not kidding you, 70 miles an hour. It's not that long of a stretch. It is not. It might be 30 houses down to the end. And uh, the, um, but the response I get is 25 is safe. And we've determined that you can't change anything as the county or the city and uh, so it's it's frustrating. So what do states and localities do? Or what should be happening? I think you have some legislation you're looking at in California, Salida. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, I was going to say, you know, our safe systems approach um, in Los Angeles has four parts, you know, design safe streets for everyone, for all users, which includes you know, children, older adults, people walking, people biking, um, create a, um, a, a culture of safety, adopt policy and legislation and respond to relevant data. And that third leg um, that's about adopting policy and legislation is about getting at some of the systemic reasons why we end up with so few tools and so few uh, interventions to address these kinds of challenges and the 85th percentile rule is absolutely one of those. You asked a question earlier, you know, what is a safe speed? And a lot of times I think to myself, you know, what if our streets were a workplace? And I know for some people, they actually, they literally are people who work for me. Um, they are literally, the streets are their workplace. And we had OSHA come look at the street the same way they would evaluate the safety of a factory they would never allow vulnerable bodies to be in such close proximity to such fast moving large vehicles. It's just physics, you know, we're evolved to outrun predators in the wilderness. We're not evolved to survive a crash uh, with a, you know, two ton piece of steel. So our only choice uh, in cities as, as auto manufacturers have kind of abdicated the throne on um, saving anybody's life outside of the car. You know, our cars are, are really well designed to save your life if you're inside of one of them. Um, but if you're not, then what the only tools that remain to me are to um, take really aggressive measures to slow down the design speed of the street itself. But in a city like Los Angeles, where I have 7,500 miles of streets and many of them, due to some other rules that we won't talk about on this panel, um, are, are designed to accommodate the most congested 15 minutes of the day, which means that the other 23 hours, um, they go, people go really, really fast. And, and as the cars become larger and faster, um, there's a limited amount that I can do on a, you know, a five lane street that runs for miles through the valley in Los Angeles to bring down its design speed. And I certainly can't do that at scale across the entire city, across, you know, even my high injury network is 460 miles of streets. You know, the time it takes me to get money, do outreach, make sure I talk to folks, redo the design, build the project, um, is, is time consuming. Those streets didn't spring to life, you know, fully formed from, uh, somebody's brain, some traffic engineer's brain in the 80s, you know, it took decades to get the streets that we have, and it will take decades to change them. So one of the only things we can do at scale is uh, adjust the speed limits and then change the ways that we enforce them. So we are hard at work um, with an incredible champion, Assemblymember Laura Friedman um, in, in, uh, in the California State Legislature, to try and reform the 85th percentile. And we hope that a lot of times as California goes, so goes the nation. And those traffic engineers, they point to that MUTCD for a really important reason, which is design immunity, because they're the ones being deposed um, when people get injured or killed as a result of a street that they designed. And they need something to point to. 
to say, you know, this is what we're using. So the work that NACTO is doing is really critical and the reform of the 85th percentile is gonna be a long, it's gonna take a, a long time. Um, and the best time to get started would have been 20 years ago and the next best time to get started is right now. Um, so, you know, it will not be easy and it will require, I think, more leadership from entities that have a vested interest um, in reducing the amount of, of uh, severe and fatal crashes that happen on our streets that maybe aren't at the table now. Um, auto manufacturers, perhaps even insurance companies, right? A broader coalition is what is required to push back on those incumbent forces that have been so stalwart um, and so effective at absolutely eliminating any discussion around this because I cannot chase speeding drivers and, you know, uh, and, and ways around the entire city with speed humps. Um, that just won't work. And, and I need something that I can do right now today at scale. Um, and I know that some of the research is now coming out um, that wasn't there in the past. So I'm hoping that research institutions, academic institutions continue to build on it, that lowering the speed limit alone has a powerful psychological effect on the how fast drivers drive. Like that was the other pushback for a long time. Well, if you just, what's a sign? You know, it's a sign, not a cop. Like if it just says 20 miles an hour instead of 25, nobody's gonna obey that. But it turns out that that sign is really, really powerful. Um, and the more that we see that, that just communicating our expectations around people's behavior, most people like to think of themselves as good drivers um, and they, most people do want to obey the rules. And if you give them the rules that you want them to follow to keep them from ever getting involved in taking someone else's life, uh, they will follow them, the majority. So I, yeah, so I'd like to talk more about uh, what local communities could do. Um, so sometimes the local communities, they, um, they are required by the state law to do some engineering study to be able to lower their speed limit. And sometimes these engineering study are very expensive and very time consuming. Um, so I would like to talk about one of the study we did in Boston. So in 2016, uh, Massachusetts, they amended their state law to allow these local communities to uh, lower their um, city default speed limit from 30 to 25 miles per hour without conducting um, these engineering studies. And so, and then Boston, um, then the next year, January, Boston um, lowered their speed limit default citywide default speed limit from 30 to 25 miles per hour on their um, city streets. And we, um, the Institute did a study there um, to evaluate the effects of the lowered speed limits on speeds. So what we did was that we um, collected um, vehicle speeds before and after the lower speed limit um, took effective, uh, uh, became effective. And what we found was that um, the probabilities of uh, a vehicle exceeding 25 miles per hour, 30 miles per hour, and uh, 35 miles per hour all declined. And uh, the reduction was the highest for the probability of a vehicle exceeding 35 miles per hour. So this has a very important safety implication um, that the reduction in the proportion of vehicles traveling at higher speeds, because we know a small increases in the vehicle speeds could sharply increase the injury risk to these vulnerable road users. Russ? I just wanna point out um, I, from my perspective, I feel like a lot of things we're talking about uh, relate to the way that things become calcified over time, right? And we're talking about how we have to fight to get permission to change speed limits or lower speed limits and uh, these this relationship that we have with the federal government on the MUTCD and speed limits are not the only thing it's other sort of disputes that states and cities have gotten into with the FHWA over what is allowed under the uh, MUTCD and whether it's voluntary or not and there's this tendency for things that were voluntary to become treated as mandatory and we see that across you know federal regulations right um so i think that for an issue like speeding where we do have this uphill climb on, on, on culture and roles and responsibilities and the work that we have to do 
and we don't have national leadership where we want it to be, I think we'd like to see more flexibility given to states and communities to do what needs to be done. You know, the strategy, general strategy the, the, that we ought to be adopting on the national level is to have best practices, voluntary best practices, and give states and communities the resources they need to put in place the programs they know that will make a difference. Great, thanks very much. Um, and let's let, you know, Salita had mentioned road design. You know, I, I had uh, traveled to Ireland not so long ago and there was probably a roundabout every five minutes. And, but it slowed you down on really long stretches. There are definitely infrastructure changes that can be implemented to encourage reduced speeding. I mentioned my neighborhood, that stretch of road is completely straight and there's no allowance for speed bumps, speed, you know, tables, any of it. And so, but the way it was designed encourages speeding. So how, uh, you know, how should traffic engineers start thinking about that. I mean, Salida, you mentioned it takes decades to get to where we are and has uh, it, with our nation's infrastructure and it's gonna take decades to make changes. So how do you continue that push in the, for a long, a long, long term? You gotta get it as a line item in your budget. <laughs> can't just be, I'm serious, you know, it, it, I have a Vision Zero action plan and the first year in, in LA that we had Vision Zero, we had a little line item in for $600,000. Now, that is not all the money we spent on traffic safety projects. We have lots of state, local and federal grants um, that we receive. We're very blessed to be in a self-help county where we've got sales tax measures and other things that we invest. But, you know, that line item has now grown to $64 million. It's still not enough, and it still only represents one part of the overall pie. Um, but, but, you know, show me your, your planning document, and, you know, I'll, I'll tell you what your, your, you know, dreams are. Show me your budget, and I'll tell you what you really value. And so, you know, I'm hopeful that we begin to see an apportion in um, you know, the, the federal authorization, reauthorization, the state budget, city budgets, MPO budgets, that is a vision zero line item that requires cities, counties, states to come up with a vision zero action plan based on a safe systems approach. That's one of the most uh, underrated powers of, of state and federal government is uh, nudging sort of um, action changes at the, at the, at the local level um, by putting in funding requirements. I mean, that's the reason we have bike plans in California is because there was a line item in the state budget that said, if you want access to this grant money, you better have a bike plan and it better have these 12 required elements. And that's why all our bike plans look the same, but that's why we all have bike plans. And that was back in the you know 90s that that happened. And look at the blossoming of bike infrastructure um, in American cities, even over the last decade. Um, and the other piece of it that's really critical is, is outside advocacy. And I think the work that um, Amy does and Ken does um, is, is an absolutely essential part of um, keeping our eyes on the prize. Um, but I'm hopeful that we start to see those kinds of requirements um, because that will, that will be the real sort of um, beginning of a true kind of uh, sustained sea change. I also just wanna weigh in on, you know, what should not be a part of the process. I mean, I think it's important when people say, you know, you want to have community input, but that should not be veto power. Um, so I'll just give an example in New York City, every design change that needs to be made, they uh, go through what's called the community board, which are people who are appointed uh, for life by the borough president. Um, who've been there a, a long time and they become a vocal minority of opposition. So we decided to combat that and show that they weren't representative of the desires of communities. And we hired a polling firm who did, who did a poll, Transportation Alternatives did, and we showed strong support on a variety of questions. It was between 63 and 81% on street design issues. 
of making streets safer, even if it meant fewer parking spots, less space for vehicles, more space for bike lanes, for bus lanes, for places to play. And those questions um, held up whether people were drivers or not. And in fact, um, communities of color were uh, even more overwhelmingly in support of street design changes. And yet when we try to make them, often there's a huge opposition from a small but vocal minority on the community board. So, I mean, I think you really have to look at your community input process and, um, and not let it hold up changes that will save lives. Just building off of Amy's point, you know, public acceptance is of course a, a big part of it. And I agree with Salita that yes, we definitely need line items and Amy that, you know, there shouldn't be veto power, but we do have to get our public on board, of course. And the pandemic has done this in some way, I believe, because those of us who've had the privilege of doing so, and it is a privilege, um, have been able to go out and enjoy safe streets where we can walk and bike. And it's a privilege because it's a luxury, right? And safety shouldn't be a luxury. It's something that we should all have. But what we've seen are some, some temporary pop-ups that have many become permanent. Um, and even you know before the pandemic, um, a good example is from Bogota, Colombia, where our partner WRI worked with the city to address the fact that there was a 30 kilometer an hour speed limit, but it was largely ignored. So they did a three-day pop-up pilot with temporary materials to test some different traffic calming measures. And what they found was that driver compliance went from about 30% to 86%. And around schools, it was even more significant from about 36% to nearly 100%. Um, road users felt a lot safer and the local board is now much more willing to fund permanent traffic calming. And more of that is online if you'd like at the WRI uh, low speed zone guide. But this also speaks to the importance of starting with kids. It's really hard to argue that we should have traffic calming measures that protect our kids. Um, this is part of why Vision Zero for Youth was, was born. And again, during the pandemic, we saw some of these calming measures happen. We saw um, schools close all or part of the streets so that kids could walk and cycle to school safely. Um, and much of that has become permanent, which is great. We saw some remote drop-off areas or walking or cycling school buses. And when it comes to kid-friendly streets, there's a ton of resources for this. Um, I like the IRAP Star Ratings for Schools app, which is a very easy to use tool that rates infrastructure on a one to five star scale and makes cost-effective suggestions for improvement. And another personal favorite is of course the NACDO Streets for Kids guide. Uh, which we're really proud to support. And um, I will let you know Jenny talk about that more if she'd like, but uh, just to point you all towards that wonderful resource. Yeah, Jenny, do you wanna talk about that for a second? Sure, yeah, I mean, I think that, um, you know, Nat Natalie has spoken a little bit about, you know, sort of thinking about um, kids and the design of the roadway for kids. And, you know, one way that we sort of think about it at NACTO is thinking of kids as the universal design vehicle. So basically, you know, if you design for children and for their caretakers, you end up making streets that are uh, better for everybody. Um, and this is, you know, kind of core to the safe systems approach, that kind of concept you know, which is based on the idea that human beings make mistakes. And as Natalie mentioned earlier about having a toddler, you know, kids are, are unpredictable, you know, they're, they're predictably unpredictable always. Um, and we need to be as the roadway um, designers and engineers and operators and maintainers and policymakers making decisions that don't result in a sort of predictable unpredictability resulting in a fatality um, because, you know, kids are gonna do things that are sort of, um, that are definitely out of control of the drivers. Drivers are gonna make mistakes, human beings make mistakes, and our system needs to be able to absorb that without fatalities. Um, and, and so, you know, roadway design is a really big piece of that. Um, speed limits are a big piece of that. When mentioned the, the impact that speed limits have on reducing speeds, um, and, you know, vehicle design is another really big piece of that. SUVs are, um, you know, growing in popularity. A number of the biggest car companies in the United States have said that they're no longer going to be producing um, small vehicles or sedans 
But SUVs, you know, again, we're talking about a, a, a math relationship here of, you know, force equals mass times acceleration. The more massive an object is, um, the likelier it is to result in a more forceful crash. So SUVs are significantly more dangerous um, at any speed than a smaller size vehicle. And especially when you're talking about children who are often more difficult to see the higher up in a cab you are, right? So it, whether it's an SUV or even a, or a truck, um, vehicle design and the sight lines of a vehicle and um, you know the weight of a vehicle are all hugely important pieces of uh, safe systems as well. And, and I know that's potentially gonna be a, a topic of a future NTSB conversation, um, but it, it feels particularly relevant when you're talking about kids. No, thank you. And I, I thought I saw, Ken, did you have, did you want to chime in at some point or was I? Sure, I'll, I'll chime in right, right now and just uh, point out, you know, Amy mentioned our poor performance relative to other high income countries. And one of the reasons for that is that other countries test for bicycle and pedestrian safety when they're testing vehicles. Um, so that's a, a major thing that the U.S. could do, other countries already do and we just don't. Um, so that's something Congress is looking at in the House and Senate right now, and we hope that there's some movement there. Um, one of the things that we haven't seen movement in either the House or Senate on um, is something that's gonna be standard in all new vehicles in Europe next year, uh, which is intelligent speed assist, which helps people go the speed limit. Um, that technology exists, that technology is proven, it's cost-effective, it's safe, um, and we just aren't willing to uh, implement it in the United States yet. I, I hope we get there because uh, it's an easy thing that can save lives. And I know when I drive my car, it would help me have peace of mind getting that, that feedback that I'm going the speed limit. I'm always looking to make sure that I'm going the speed limit. And anything that assists me in doing that, I, I would love to have that in my vehicle. Now, and that's a great, uh, that's a great actually transition to technology. And I'm when I'm going to call on you in a second and see if you could talk about some great things that IIHS has been doing. Wait, before I do that, maybe Amy, I don't want to go, I, I don't want to move forward yet because I did want Amy to, if you could talk for a second about what you're doing in New York, because I know you have legislation in New York that I, I think that is, that is named after your son, Sammy too. So I didn't know if you wanted to talk about that real quick. Sure, I'll talk about that, but I do want to just weigh in and add on something that Russ said sure. about lack of leadership at the federal level. So, you know, we all need to step in at local levels and, and make changes. I think we also need to push back and say we need some leadership at the federal level also. I mean, I learned something recently. I'm sure everybody on this panel, but maybe not everybody on the call knows, but I was horrified to learn that every year states, in order to get their federal transportation dollars, have to predict how many people are going to die on our roadways. They have to basically sign the death warrant for so many people and throw up their hands and say, this is what I think is going to happen. And they're allowed to predict higher than they did the year before and still get all the money. I mean, I, it just so astonishes me that this is so against common sense. How is that even possible? You know, last year we had the highest year on record. And each one of those numbers is somebody like my son and someone like my family you know, the highest number of people were killed on our roadways, and yet California and other states have predicted that more are going to die in the coming year, and they still get all their funding. That is not federal leadership. That is abdicating federal responsibility. I mean, you know, the buck stops here, and dollars speak, and, 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 and so on. I don't know if Russ wants to respond to that. I wasn't criticizing you about it, just about this idea of federal leadership. And then I'm happy to talk about Sammy's level. Sure. Yeah, so I would say that uh, so every every year states go through this process to try and measure their performance. And, and as you said, they measure fatalities and serious injuries. And there's a whole list of performance measures that they go through trying to calculate. So states look at the data as what crashes have occurred. They look at what resources they have available and make a prediction of what might happen. And sometimes, as as Amy said, it will be it may be more, it may be the same, um, it may decrease. But it's not, I don't think it's a wish for this to happen. It's more of a reflection of this is realistically what we can expect. And the reason they do this is not, as I said, to set a, this is not what we want. This is to sort of try and set a goal. So like, if we were to say states can't predict uh, increases or the states can only predict like that they're gonna, uh, that the, the traffic deaths will decrease or other metrics will decrease, 
okay, but that's not valuable for planning. I mean, it's 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 aspirational for sure, but it doesn't really help us figure out what went wrong and why and what we can do better. So I would push back in the sense of like, we have to decide, do we want this the data analysis that we do to be useful for planning or do we want to set a goal? Because we're going to set a goal, it should be zero, right? Because zero is the goal. And can I, can I add in just real quick on that one? Because I also, I, I, I had recently read uh, Smart Growth America's fantastic uh, study called Dangerous by Design. Uh, and it named the 10 states that set targets higher than the number of deaths the previous year, it's the five-year average. And, um, you know, I, and I had asked uh, a really good friend of mine who works in a state and she, she had said that as a requirement, they have to set these numbers. And if they don't meet those numbers, they don't get funding for their behavioral programs. It's a, you know, it's a, it's, that's a problem. You know, if you, if you're going to be removed if you're going to have funding not provided to you to invest in those safety programs that will reduce fatalities and injuries, hopefully eliminate them over time, but you have to pick a goal that you think you can meet that is much higher than anyone would hope, that's a problem because otherwise you face somebody taking your money away. That's a problem in the process. For sure. And there are states out there that the money they receive from NHTSA is the only money that they have. So if that money is taken away, there's no there's no program. So what are we even doing? Right. I, I So it, in a sense, maybe it's a little performative, but um, but I, I you know, I think our priority ought to be to, to try and implement programs. Yeah, I, I you know, we are so afraid and I talk about this all the time time and Ken, you're next. Uh, I we are so afraid to try new things and to change programs and to go in new direction. Sure, I, I mean, I say that we're gonna, we're gonna make mistakes, but we should try them. We should try a different approach. We should try changing uh, you know, how, we, how we set targets, how we do funding, how we you know, allow states to invest, how we allow local cities and, and, area, and communities to invest in infrastructure and improvements for their citizens. So, you know, I think we really just need to, to step back. Everybody has to step back and including at the federal level, Amy, I agree with you. Uh, Ken? Well, I, I think another one of the consequences of that performance measure is that states lose flexibility in their highway safety improvement program funds, which are infrastructure funds. Um, those have to be spent on safety if they don't meet that performance measure. Um, so by setting kind of easy to hit performance measures, they aren't committing to spending those safety funds on safety. And really many states spend a lot of their uh, federal funding um, to fight congestion rather than to improve safety. So we need to use tools to guide good decisions at the state and local level to make safety a priority, like many of many agencies say, uh, but we don't see it in their investment decisions. I wonder how quickly this all would change if we said, you know what, states have to keep on coming up with these numbers, but the federal government um, also, NHTSA also has to give states a baseline number of fatalities that they know will occur uh, resulting from the larger, you know, and higher grill of SUVs and the portion, overall portion of those SUVs that are currently on the road. If it was a shared number, that really reflected the shared responsibility and the roles of each of those entities in those numbers, I bet we might be having a slightly different discussion um, about what the role of those numbers really ought to be because yes, the states have to do better. They have to do much better at coming up with, there need to be strings attached to that number um, that you know require them to have a safe systems approach, uh, require them to have other things and other you know streams of investment that give them the flexibility to put the money where they know it needs to go, but being held accountable against real numbers. But we also have to acknowledge the federal government's role here in approving 
repeatedly vehicles that we know are going to kill children, full stop, and not holding auto manufacturers accountable to any kind of design changes that would have different outcomes um, on the road. And, you know, NHTSA itself, I don't mean to beat up on them because they're not here to defend themselves, um, but, you know, NHTSA has in their own studies and documents, they acknowledge that the prevalence of SUVs is one of the primary factors in the rise in pedestrian fatalities. And then they promote safety campaigns that focus on distracted walking. It's a very confusing kind of thing for those of us who are working on road safety to try and figure out where do we go at the federal level? Where are the people who really understand and who are really willing to commit to trying something new, Jennifer, to your point, because y'all know that saying, if you always do what you always did, you always get what you always got. Those numbers aren't gonna change unless we change some of the formulas and the, the you know, processes that we use to, to reach them. And we bring some more accountability into the process and assign it properly where it needs to go. I think the investment that's being made is wholly insufficient. If you look at national fatality numbers over time and how it changes, you know, it's hard to tell like what any of the federal programs or state programs, or it's hard to tell what a difference it's making. But when the economy changes, you know, the fatalities go down and grow up. So it's like pure exposure, shifting those numbers. And you just raise a question of like, well, are we investing enough? I think clearly the answer is no. And Salida made a great point. If you want to see what someone's priorities priorities are, look at the budget. And if you look at the federal budget and spending out of the highway trust fund, I think it's something like 5%, only 5% of that at most goes to safety programs. You ask anyone in DC and transportation, what's the number one priority? They will say safety. Well, the budget tells a much different story. Very true. Well, let's, let's uh, I could stay on this topic for a very long time, uh, but let's transition to safe vehicles for, uh, uh, because I think that's an important topic. Kenny knows we are on record for many years supporting many important safety technologies as standard in vehicles, not luxury. It should not be, you should not have to uh, pay more money. Safety shouldn't be a luxury. It's those, that is reserved for other things in your vehicle, but we are on record strongly supporting automatic emergency braking, forward collision warning, uh, lane departure warning, uh, intelligent speed adapt adaptation, which you mentioned, uh, Ken, uh, which is going to be mandatory in Europe or is mandatory almost in Europe. Uh, but when you have, uh, IAHS has done tremendous research. Obviously, you do crash testing yourselves. Uh, but why don't you talk about some of your research on vehicle safety and what IAHS does? Sure. So um, I would like just, first of all, I would like to echo the point that um, vehicle technologies should be a key part of the efforts to attack the speeding problem. But um, currently in the United States, it's underused. Um, and among all these vehicle um, technologies that could help with the speeding problem, um, head headlights. Um, we have been um, evaluating the performance of vehicles' headlights. Um, good headlights could help drivers see clear and further at night, which would give the drivers more time to react to the road hazard. Um, and uh, meanwhile, as we all know, vehicles have become more powerful. And uh, so a few years ago, we had this question um, saying, okay, what is the link between the vehicles horsepower and the vehicle speed. So with that question in mind, we did a study. Um, um, so for this study, we uh, collected vehicle speeds at um, 10 sites where the posted speed limit uh, varied between 40 and uh, 65 miles per hour. So uh, we also collected vehicle information and driver character characteristics. So this study basically found that um, the mean passenger vehicle speeds um, increased as the vehicle became more powerful. And also uh, the probability of a vehicle exceeding the speed limit, uh, either by any amount or by 10 miles per hour, also um, 
increased as the vehicle became more powerful. Um, so we really have access to these vehicle information. So between just some numbers, between um, 1981 and uh, 2019 model year, the average vehicle horsepower increased by about 100% for cars and SUVs and for pickups the average horsepower increased by uh, 165% between these two model years. And uh, so earlier this year, we also re released um, some high speed um, crash test results together with the AAA Foundation for Traffic Safety. Um, so for these crash tests, the impact speeds were at 40 miles per hour, 50 miles per hour, and 56 miles per hour. So just to let you know, so IHS, we do um, the vehicle crash worthiness crash tests. And for this uh, crash test, our um, crash speed is 40 miles per hour for these frontal um, crash tests. And uh, in this higher speed crash test, we see increased injury risk to pedestrians, even in the good rated vehicles. So at 40 miles per hour, we see very minimal uh, intrusion to the vehicles, um, to the driver's um, space. But at 50 miles per hour, we see um, very noticeable deformation to the driver's um, side door opening and uh, the dashboard and the leg space. And then at 56 miles per hour, we saw um, that the vehicle's interior, interior design was compromised significantly. And uh, the dummy sensor, um, for the information we get from the dummy sensors, all this information indicates very severe injuries to the driver. So what did this say? So there have been some um, vehicle safety improvements, such as um, airbags and improved vehicle structure, which we know offer safety benefits to the vehicle occupants. But these higher speeds, they just cancel out the safety benefits these uh, vehicle improvement could bring us. Um, so um, a few years ago, we did a study examining um, increase the, the, the link between increasing speed limits and uh, traffic fatalities. And based on the findings, we calculate that in 2017, there were more than 1,900 deaths um, that would not have occurred if the speed limit um, in the United States had remained at the 1997 level. And for that same year, 2017, NHTSA uh, estimated that about 2,800 lives were saved by frontal airbags. So these numbers just say that um, lives lost by these higher speed limits just have cut into the benefits offered by these um, vehicle safety improvement. So what are, what are some of the technologies that have the greatest potential for saving lives in vehicles? So I would say, I uh, just can mention the ISA, the Intelligent um, Speed Assistance. Uh, so in Europe, it has, their research has shown that this is probably the most effective uh, vehicle technologies to fight the speeding problem. And there are also other um, products um, such as the max maximum speed limiters. They're currently used um, by the fleet owners and by the parents of teens. Um, and uh, there are also third, part, third party telematics, which provide information to drivers um, um, on the speeds relative to the speed limits. But again, these um, products are mostly used by the insurance companies and fleet managers. Um, of course, these um, the fleet companies and insurance companies, the probably um, are looking at more information than just speeding, but um, this is the potential, um, this has the potential to help with the speeding problem. And when some of our uh, viewers might not know what intelligent speed assist is or intelligent speed adaptation, can you talk about that for a second? Yeah, the intelligent speed assistance, it's um, a name for the in-vehicle systems that provide the driver uh, on the speeds 
relative to the posted speed limits. So depending on the system, it um, warns the drivers or it prevents the drivers from exceeding the speed limit. So these technologies, they either use the GPS technologies linked to speed limit maps or use uh, on-road sensors or cameras that could read um, posted speed limit signs. Great. And how about technologies that could uh, reduce uh, crashes. Have you have you all done work on automatic uh, uh, emergency braking or forward collision warning? And maybe you can talk about some of the difference be differences between your crash testing and this is crash testing. So uh, yeah, we have done research um, to evaluate the effect, the safety effects of um, some vehicle um, technologies such as the. Um, automatic emergency braking systems, and um, also um, the blind zone warnings. We have done research um, on these vehicle technologies, and we have found that um, these technologies, they could um, basically reduce some crash, some uh, crash, crash, some crash types and improve safety. Um, and um, there's also, um, there are some driver assistance technologies such as adaptive cruise control, which could automatically um, adjust the vehicle speed to maintain um, a preset following distance to the vehicle in front. And uh, there have been research showing that um, with these uh, adaptive cruise control, driver, drivers on average maintain a longer following distance to the vehicle in front. And there are fewer passing and lane changing. So, they also probably um, could um, have some safety benefits. Um, so, and yes, we have done um, vehicle crash worthiness um, crash tests um, every year. Um, and uh, so for this, we also, in these crash tests, we also evaluate um, the, the headlight, as I just mentioned, and uh, um, the driver assistance technologies, um, how well they, um, like how well a vehicle could um, prevent a crash in front, uh, pre prevent like a collision with the vehicle in front. And uh, we publish these ratings every year. Um, so I think in all, all these vehicle technologies, they, um, they work together, they, um, they have great potential to um, improve the road safety. And one way to encourage uh, manufacturers to put uh, these technologies in their vehicles is with, through uh, crash testing and rating. And uh, we have been pushing uh, NHTSA to improve their new car assessment program. And I believe others on this panel have weighed in on that. I don't know, Ken, did your group weigh in? Yes, and uh, Amy just joined me and uh, Advocates for Highway and Auto Safety yesterday on a call about improving the new car assessment program. Um, it's, it's incredible the work that uh, the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety does and AAA's Foundation for Traffic Safety um, to test vehicles. Um, but really, we need the, the federal government to test vehicles um, for those technologies so that IHS and AAA and other groups that like consumer reports that do testing can continue to push forward rather than have their resources taken up testing uh, these, these kind of technologies that should be standard in all vehicles. I think it's, it's also worth noting to relate this back to speed, things like automatic emergency braking work much better at lower speeds. Uh, the, the research that is out there shows that kind of 35 miles per hour and above, it significantly diminishes the probability that that system is gonna break and stop a collision with somebody biking or walking. So having lower speed roads is still relevant when we have these safety technologies. Um, and then just also thinking about uh, cruise control. Um, I, 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 I kind of think it's crazy that you can set cruise control above the speed limit. Um, you know, it's simple things like that where we can start making changes and that will maybe change the culture of it's just not acceptable to speed. Why do we, as regulators, as auto manufacturers, uh, build that into our systems. 
I just wanted to share, you know, we were trying to work on a pilot with uh, the city agency that purchases vehicles. And he was sharing that models that were standard in Europe that have a lot of these technologies and better visibility and side guards and, you know, standard in Europe, he couldn't even get them to buy them here because, you know, there, there is no requirement here. So there is no, you know, market and process here. And it just goes to why are we at the bottom of the list in terms of every country? Because we are not making these requirements and making safety a priority. And then even places who want to innovate, it becomes difficult to put those places, you know, changes in place because they can't even get the vehicles. Well, in the new car assessment program in Europe, it's much stronger. Uh, they look at far more, which does encourage uh, uh, changes and improvements in vehicles. And so they look at far more than we do. It's, uh, it's something we're hoping uh, that we adopt as well. Natalie, I saw that you. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'd love to just jump in. You know, Amy made an important point and it's also important to note that the first NCAP started here in the US, right? So what happened that we started this and now we're falling behind and we're at the bottom of that list, as we mentioned, you know, everything that we do here in this country has ramifications internationally. And I feel that right now, um, at this moment, we are at an important turning point where the US can once again reestablish itself as a leader in, in global road safety. So what we're talking about here today goes far beyond our borders. And I wanna just point out one thing, we were talking a little about uh, crash testing. You know, both the US and EU uh, vehicle safety research still uses crash test dummies that were designed in the 1970s, modeled after the average male body. Now, this is such a gender equity issue, right? Um, we need to be addressing this because it means that women are 73% more likely than men to be injured in a crash because of these gender biases. Yet we buy as women 50% of all vehicles and influence 80% of all buying decisions. So this is just one small example of where we can take a stand on this in the US and have international ramifications. Great discussion. Um, I want to move to a couple of different areas. Uh, I do want to address uh, data at some point if we have time, but I also want to talk a little bit about tra traffic safety culture. Uh, it's probably the toughest to deal with behavior change. It really is. And you know, some of these other measures that we've talked about are, are, are sometimes far easier than dealing with changing decision-making or, cha or uh, affecting uh, uh, a person's decision to speed or a mistake made, which is why we try to focus on all the other issues. But, but talking about traffic safety culture is important and you know, how we address that because it is in many ways, socially acceptable to speed. I drive I-95 all the time. Uh, in the HOV lanes, it's 65, not in the HOV lanes, it's 55. If I set my cruise control for 55, there are a lot of angry people at me and they are not afraid to show it. <laughs> they are, and they're going 90 miles an hour as if that's normal. What's interesting though, is if I see an impaired driver, everybody backs off and stays away from that vehicle and slows down. It's just very, it's just a totally different viewpoint. Um, so with that in mind, um, Russ, do you wanna talk a little bit about the importance of traffic safety culture? And, and you know, I, we're going to talk uh, uh, about uh, that more when we get to road users. Uh, but it is something that we have to keep in mind uh, as we move forward. And then I do want to get into enforcement a little bit and you know, have Kenny talk about that and we'll, and we'll probably have some, some disagreement here and that's okay. Uh, but it's definitely something that we, we should talk about. So Russ, do you want to talk about that for a second? 
Sure, absolutely. So there's no doubt we've faced an uphill battle on culture. Like people feel they can speed with impunity and they do. It's like everyone does it. No one really has a fear of getting in a crash, getting a ticket or having any other negative consequence. Uh, and so uh, these are ideas that people have in their mind about this. And, uh, and it, we haven't really cultivated this sense of changing culture around speeding as much as we have other highway safety issues. And I think back many decades ago to where we were with drunk driving, where it was a joke, it was a punchline. And now, now friends don't let friends drive drunk. And everyone has a very fixed idea about uh, drunk driving and drunk drivers and what, you know, that they've done something wrong, socially wrong, and need to be held accountable for that. That doesn't exist for speeding. And I think that everything that we're talking about is the sort of like physical interventions in the war in the real world help to change culture. But even that's that's a struggle too. And I think that we, we, one thing we can do sort of on the side is also think about ways that we can better make a difference in changing culture in the way that uh, that the high safety community changed the culture around drunk driving many decades ago that we're trying to do in other issues as well. And we took a look back and see like, well, what kind of models can we base this on? And we think about like how Mothers Against Drunk Driving gave voice to victims. They changed the idea of a drunk driver. The idea of a drunk driver didn't exist. It was just like, you know, everyone, everyone sort of does it, right? And sort of the same way we think about speed. But what if we found a way to give voice to victims of speeding crashes or survivors of speeding crashes, found a way to change the idea of like what a speeding driver is. It's not it's not all of us. It's a very specific category of wrongdoing. Um, that I think that could be tremendously helpful. But um, it's going to have to happen. I think with all the other things that we're working on the same way. You know, we change the physical infrastructure. We create more meaningful penalties for wrongdoing, and then also work really, really purposefully on this traffic safety culture, um, public education side of things. I think it all needs to work in concert. I was just going to jump in and say that um, there's this uh, incredible researcher at UNC, um, and I'm, my high school French is going to fail me. His name is Seth Lajeunesse, I think, uh, is his last name. And uh, he gave a presentation at TRB a few, several years ago that I was lucky enough to catch. It was very early on a Saturday, and it was just one of those little gems, you know, that you stumble upon when you're in that sea of brilliance, and you're like, yes, thank God I was here. And the point he made was that, you know, in the United States, we, uh, we live in a competitive capitalist society. So there is tremendous societal pressure to get where you're going fast and to move goods quickly, right? And, and a lot of our grant programs and all these other things are, are, reinforce that. Um, and that culture in the United States, in, in Northern Europe and other places that have had success, they have a very different kind of acceptance of top-down uh, trust in, in government oversight, in government regulation. They believe strongly in that. Um, and they, they, they're they willing to follow what, what that top-down approach is. And drunk driving, seatbelts, these are great examples of where um, culture change did happen. Smoking, all of those, you know, culture change did happen, but it had to come from the ground up. It had to come in the United States. It has to, this grassroots piece is really critical. And so, you know, taking a, a close look at how we fund um, community-based organizations, nonprofits, organizers that are doing the hard work of, of trying to, you know, coalition build and, and lift up uh, from the ground up, I think is, is a really important um, and undervalued way that we could be investing public money. Um, in Los Angeles, we managed to scrape together a little money to do real market research, which govern, we never get, we never have that luxury. We never get to do that. And we use it to inform a safety campaign um, because what we discovered is that the majority of the drivers in these crashes were men uh, between the ages of 18 and 40. And the majority, eight, eight out of 10 of them think of, thought of themselves as good drivers. Um, and they didn't wanna be vict villainized, you know? And so for our campaign, it was, you know, at, at 40 miles an hour, even a good driver's car is deadly. Be a hero, save a kid, slow down. And, you know, it was a, a shown from the driver's perspective, a man, uh, a man's eyes looking in a rear view mirror um, and a child crossing the street. And so I think we don't have enough of those. It's not, it's not magic. It's not going to change it overnight. We don't have nearly enough of that kind of informed um, and uh, bolstered by research work on how to do that ground up stuff. It's just in most government agencies, we're full of very technical people that went to school for technical jobs. They're not uh, communicators and they're certainly not in advertising and we can't compete 
with the millions of dollars that are invested in these expensive media markets to glamorize driving and to glamorize driving fast. Um, and so there's a there's a there's a place where I think the government could invest more money and, and play more of a powerful role in leveling the playing field. Yeah, not just so Seth is with the Collaborative Sciences Center for Road Safety at uh, UNC and um, and uh, they are actually doing a number of um, uh, webinars over the next several weeks, all focused on a safe system. Uh, I encourage people to go to their website to check it out because they're doing incredible work. I'll also say Nick Ward with Montana State University does great work on traffic safety culture and hope to have him at a future round table when we talk about uh, 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 safe road users. And I'll, I'll point out, um, you know, the, the UNC or the Collaborative Sciences Center for Road Safety, uh, Eric Dumbaugh, who will probably be at uh, our Safe Road panel, uh, from Florida Atlantic University, but is part of this Collaborative Sciences Center for Road Safety. And his colleagues had done some research called Implementing Safe Systems in the United States, Guiding Principles and Lessons from International Practice. I think it's an incredible uh, uh, report. It really talks about whether, what other countries have done to move toward a safe system approach talks about New Zealand and the Netherlands and Australia and Sweden and uh, UK and others. But it, in here, uh, they do state, and I know we're gonna have some disagreement on the panel about uh, uh, enforcement and that's okay. I think, you know, we all, it's, it's, a, it's a conversation we have to have. And so I, I, in reading their report and in speaking with uh, Wendy, who was on our last panel from the Netherlands, she had said the key is to uh, uh, focus on designing a system to prevent uh, that human error in the first place, but that enforcement was still one of the tools that they used to, to ensure uh, that laws were being abided by, uh, but obviously not their first tool in the toolbox, but still a tool. And so, and that is the case with most, actually all the countries in this, in this report. So I'm wondering from your perspective, where does enforcement fall in a safe systems approach? Before getting there, I, I just want to give a shout out to Nick Ward. He was doing a webinar on the safe systems for the National Center for Rural Road Safety last month. Um, and he, he walked through the assumptions of a safe system that they have in, in Northern Europe. I don't know if it was Sweden or Netherlands. Um, but one was the designers of the roadway transportation system were ultimately responsible for the deaths and serious injuries occurring in the system. Over 66% of people attending that webinar disagreed with that assumption. So when we're talking about traffic safety culture, agency culture and agency commitment to fulfilling that assumption is, is critically important. We aren't gonna get the cultural buy-in of drivers if we don't have our agencies committed to giving them uh, the transportation system that allows them to succeed. Um, e even when we're, we're doing enforcement, if it's automated speed enforcement, if we have a roadway where we've had a speed camera for a decade, and it consistently gives us the same speeding numbers, that should be a flashing red light that we need to have a roadway redesign of that segment. Um, it's, it's just going to cut into le the legitimacy of enforcement if we don't complement that with roadway redesign and investment. And I don't necessarily need to go first in, on enforcement. I'll let you all think about that. Maybe I'll jump in after. But I just wanted to share a little tidbit on um, the culture change issue that I guess is enforcement related. So um, as I mentioned, New York City has the nation's largest speed safety camera program. And I think something that the city did quite well was they wanted to remind people why speeding was dangerous. So with every speed camera ticket, they have prepared a, a little insert that has a story of one of our members. And, you know, speeding, this could have been something you caused. You know, I talked about Sammy, I talked about, they had dozens and dozens of different people they featured and, and they went in every single ticket. So I think it is helping people understand 
you know, why a, a, a redesign or an enforcement program is important, really elevating the, the personal impact that this has if we don't address, address this crisis. No, great point. Kenny, you, you set up, uh, I mean, your background is in law enforcement, so maybe you could uh, talk about this. And you also, I believe, established a um, automatic uh, speed enforcement program in, uh, what was it, Prince George's County, but why don't you talk about some of your experience? Well, I, I, think, I think the main purpose and the main point of enforcement is to modify individuals and, but it, like any other thing, like any, like any other strategy, you have, have so you, you just can't give an officer a, a, a radar gun and say, go write a bunch of tickets somewhere because, you know, that's not a strategy. Enforcement should be focused on violations that are likely to cause crashes or injury, and it should be done in locations where, where these violations are likely to occur. And if, if it's done responsibly, if it's done systematically with a strategy, I think in many instances, it will get community support. Um, and as, as far as um, automated enforcement, automated enforcement is a double-edged sword because many times um, community view it as a revenue tool. Um, so how do you, you know, how can you, you employ that and still get community support when, when they, they simply look at it as a way for the government to get money? Um, and so even when I ran our program, we, we often had to remove the cameras because once drivers get used to it, you know, they slow down for that, that, that 15 feet and then they, they resume driving again. And, you know, we would, we would put active actual officers beyond the, 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 uh, the automated enforcement and they would get, they would get pretty good speeds, you know, less than a half mile from, from the automated enforcement. So, you know, just points, my point is, it's not just one strategy that will work. You have to employ everything. Yeah, agreed. And and when I think you and possibly Russ's organization, I could be wrong on that, recently put together a checklist on automated speed enforcement because that's exactly right. And Salida, you had said you have to get, I think it was you said you have to get uh, public buy-in. I could, and that's critical, uh, but um, maybe you could talk a little bit about the checklist because it has been the case in states where they where the citizens have viewed automatic automated speed enforcement as a revenue generator, but it has been quite successful in some areas and in other countries. When? Sure, sure. so um, Yes, so we, um, earlier this year, IHS and together with several other safety organizations, we published a checklist. Um, it's a automated enforcement uh, best, practice check, uh, best practice checklist. It's this two page, easy to follow um, guidance. Uh, we hope that this could help um, jurisdictions to build a well-run program from the very beginning, from step number one. So um, some takeout from the checklist is that um, this program should always, always focus on safety, not benefits. And the public, they should know that speed cameras, they are very effective in reduced speeding and uh, in reduced injury crashes. Um, and speeding is very dangerous. And um, also to make sure to bring the public along the entire process, keep the process transparent. Um, so the, so the public, public input is very important. And uh, so the checklist recommends that there should be uh, um, committees made up of um, different stakeholders such as, um, such as law enforcement, uh, victim advocates, civil rights advocates, school officials and residents and uh, bring them along and uh, ask for their help to make decisions, to guide through the entire process. And uh, the other thing is that um, speed cameras should be part of a comprehensive speed management program. And this program should also, besides enforcement, should also include engineering um, and uh, public education and uh, road design improvement. They're all 
very important part of a speed management program. And um, also the other thing is that, um, so the site selection, the site selection for speed camera placement. So the site selection should be based on data, like violation, crashes data, and field observations and public input. And um, the contractors should not get involved in the site selection process. And also once these um, sites with problems are selected, um, it feel, like field visits should be conducted to make sure that um, if there is any obvious problem that could be solved, um, for example, the speed limit was not appropriate. So these problems should be corrected before um, the speed cameras are placed at these locations. Yes. Uh, oh, says, sorry, Go ahead. Oh, sorry. I was going to say GSA sign on in support of that list. And that there are many best practices out there, but it's all about radical transparency. It's about community involvement. It's about due diligence and being data driven. And we look at it's, it's going to be a long road because even though we have all, all this stuff, we know that there's still strong feelings out there. When we look back on the history of automated enforcement, and there was such strong public opinion that literally we had politicians shutting down these programs. And I think to some of the things we talked about today, which which are kind of forward leaning and leading the public to where we want them to be, like lowering speed limits. But if we don't do the due diligence to convey the why, I, I feel like you know we have to keep we have to cultivate public support, or else you know our days might be numbered on some of those things. You know, you know, I think Russ has a good point. We, we talk about impairment, how views have changed over the years. You know. Kenny, I think you're cutting out. Oh, there you go. Uh, I, I still think the majority of people don't don't associate the risk associated with, with, um, with speeding as they do with impaired driving. And, you know, the NTSB have made We've made recommendations in the past um, to help courts how to deal with, you know, problem offenders and impaired driving. We haven't done that with, with speeding um, repeat offenders. And that, that's another area that's, that's a right for improvement and right for discussion. Um, I'm, I kind of want to just say a couple of things about um, just, you know, sort of the the context within which we're talking about enforcement. I think that at the beginning of this member, Hamidu, you said that there are some, might be some, you know, varying opinions on enforcement. I think it's important to name why that is. Um, you know, there's, there's a number of factors involved in enforcement in the United States in particular as a, as a, as a country, right. That's are very, very different than in the Netherlands. I think that enforcement, especially automated enforcement can be really effective. But there's also really good data to show that the way that enforcement is levied is not um, equitable. So there have been a couple of different studies that have come out showing that uh, Black people in this country are more likely to be stopped um, by an officer, um, even though um, Black drivers drive less than white drivers, um, and that after their stop, uh, Black drivers were uh, 115 percent, according to this one study I'm looking at, more likely to more likely to be searched in a traffic stop. Um, and then the other kind of like complementary complementary piece of this is that um, in, in the United States, you know, um, the the traffic safety outcomes, as Lita mentioned at the beginning of this call, um, are incredibly imbalanced for especially Black uh, people living in this country. So. Um, uh, black communities and black people experience much higher rates of traffic violence than uh, white people. Um, drivers are less likely to stop. A number of studies have showed that drivers are less likely to stop for um, black people, black pedestrians crossing the street. Um, and then we also see that when it comes to in traffic enforcement, um, black people walking and black people biking are getting more tickets for biking and walking than white people. Um, so we have, you know, sort of, uh, um, a, a real sort of imbalance in the way that traffic enforcement is being levied. And then the, the thing on top of that is that we, we have the worst traffic safety numbers in, in the industrialized world. So we have an enforcement system that's not really working, even though there's this sort of 
um, you know, generalized sense that, yeah, enforcement is a really important part of the, the traffic safety equation. So I think Kenny mentioned at the beginning when he started talking about the Im importance of focusing on the, the known um, conditions that we know result in crashes, especially that we know result in um, injury crashes and fatal crashes. And I think that's really, really important because um, you know, traffic safety uh, has been used as a way to uh, stop drivers, especially black drivers and Latinx drivers and indigenous drivers um, across the country under the, the sort of pretense of safety, um, but actually used for other purposes. And that's not having any meaningful impact on our, on our traffic safety outcomes. And, and so it's really important to, to acknowledge all of that when we're having a conversation about enforcement. Uh, I, I think I think Jenny Jenny is absolutely correct in all in a lot of those assertions, but then it, that, that speaks to the fact that when a law enforcement agencies go out and just say go write me a bunch of tickets, and then they they use that metric uh, to define good law enforcement, that's when you encounter some of those problems. But and I was I was been I benefited from working for an agency for twenty years that we went from just go write a bunch of tickets to hey we have problems. Let's strategize how we're going to address those problems. And, and I think if we can do that, if we can promote that, if we can highlight um, an agency as a best practices, then we promote um, traffic safety and improving some of those social concerns that Jenny brought up. Can I just jump in and say one thing? Because I know we were going to talk about data, but I bet we run out of time. Um, because yeah, we're definitely going to run out of time. I'm already <laughs> getting the text of you have five great minutes. Discussion. Like, I have another hour worth of stuff I want to talk to these kids about. It's so one point that I want to make, data. which is the another role of law enforcement is is in the immediate aftermath of a crash, and they're often the first ones on the scene. And one of the problems that we have in working together as a safety community is that we really speak very different language on the traffic engineering and planning side and on the enforcement side when it comes to talking about the root causes of crashes. And part of that has to do with what the officers on the scene record as the cause of a crash. And one of the very specific changes that I think we could work together on making is changing the forms themselves that officers use. Because if you look at the cause, the primary collision factor on those, on those crash forms, they, speeding does not show up. Um, because it's very difficult for an officer to make that assessment. If we just had a, they, and they might you know, be including a primary and secondary collision factor tied to the CVC for insurance purposes, but if we could just have a little check box where that officer could check and say, yeah, it's obvious this driver was speeding, but I'm not, you know, then, then that might actually be a, a systemic thing that could help get to the things that Wen is talking about. If we're gonna tell officers, go out and write tickets for the real causes of crashes, then our data needs to match and uh, that's not the fault of an officer dealing with a very chaotic scene where it's difficult um, to really get at the root causes of those crashes. So I, I do think that um, it's impossible for us to say what the right role of enforcement is in the United States because we're having a national conversation about what Jenny referred to, which is the use of enforcement for pretextual stops and not for traffic safety, and then a, a true mismatch in the way that the people who record the causes of the crashes and the people who design the streets um, and the researchers are looking at the causes of crashes themselves. That's actually what I wanted to get into at some point. And Kenny, I know you have a comment, so I'll go to you uh, because this is exactly what we said in our speeding report in 2017. I mean, I think the data we're looking at severely underestimates the speeding epidemic uh, in the US because I think uh, the data uh, is, is, is incomplete. Uh, and that's what we found in our studies and, and in a lot of the information that we put out. But Kenny? No, I'm just going to co-sign on Salita's assertion. Even with the NTSB, um, we do crashes around the country, and it's amazing how different the police reports are, the information, the processes are. So that is certainly an opportunity for national leadership um, if we can set a standard of best practices that agencies can then follow. And I would say uh, that when we, you know, a police officer arrives at a crash scene and historically police are there to like deal with people problems, right? So they look at the people, but the, you know, they miss these other details that are salient for our purposes of looking at the roadway or looking at the speed limit and all these things. And is it possible to train police officers to analyze and record all that? I don't know, 
but maybe it's worth a look to do so to see if we can get a better, a more effective set of data to get really get at the root causes of these crashes. Well, that's no, why no, the work think, Kenny does is so important. No, I, I, Russ, I think you're right. Um, when I was a police officer, I was a crash reconstructionist. So, you know, it's just, it really, it really just depends on the, the level of resources available to the department. So maybe, you know, directing resources to those who don't have it will, will help solve. Well, we've run out of time. We've got one minute. <laughs> so I just want to say to you all, thank you so much for being part of this. This has been fantastic. You are an incredible group of, of safety professionals. I look forward to continuing to work with each of you as we move forward to improve road safety across the US. Keep, uh, you know, keep up the great work. And uh, I look forward to our, our next event. We're gonna take a little break in August because lots of folks like to take vacation in August. <laughs> uh, but we will be back with a few of uh, uh, roundtables, hopefully in September uh, uh, to be determined on the subject area. So thank you all, appreciate your participation and your work in this area. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for having us. And thank you for thank holding you. this conversation. Thank you.